meeting. Hello, welcome to Equity Makes FinFest. Hope you guys have all had a good day so far. Welcome to this particular talk, which is um, crypto market cycles. So everyone here is obviously here because you're crypto curious. My name is Tracy and I host the Crypto Curious podcast, which is part of the Equity Mates team with my co-host Blake. Blake will be talking today. It was touted as Blake and myself, but Blake is much better at talking about these things, so I'm going to leave it to Blake today. But a little intro for Blake. Blake is actually the CEO of Bamboo, and I'm the COO of Bamboo. Bamboo is a micro savings investment app that you hear a little bit about uh, throughout the talk today. But without further ado, I'll get on with it. But before Blake starts, I do have to do a disclaimer that you've probably heard a few times today. So all the information presented today is for education and entertainment purposes only. Any advice is general advice only. It's not been taken. Your personal circumstances into account needs to be uh, objective. Before acting on general advice, you should consider if it's relevant to your needs and read the relevant product disclosure statement. And if you are unsure, please speak to a finance professional. Equity Mates Media operates now under a financial service license 540697. So please welcome Blake to the stage. Hi guys, can everyone hear me? Yep, all good. Cool. So yep, my name is Blake Cassidy. I apologise if I have my back to you at any particular time, uh, but I'm the CEO of Bamboo. And Bamboo is a micro savings and micro investment platform here in Australia. And today my talk's about crypto market cycles. So crypto market cycles is quite topical at the moment and uh, I think everyone might benefit from learning just a little bit more. So as Tracy said, I'm a co-host of the Crypto Curious podcast. Uh, we've partnered with Equity Mates about 12 months ago and we're fortunate to be the number one crypto podcast in Australia. Um, so they've done an amazing job with production and distribution. So a big shout out to the Equity Mates crew for uh, the podcast I'm putting today on. So who here has ever bought high and sold low? I certainly have. <laughs> or who here has ever made an emotional trade? Yeah, I certainly have. So I think understanding market cycles will help us counteract this um, so we don't make these easy mistakes that are, are possible to be made in a highly volatile market. So trading investing can be hard. So understanding market cycles really can help us position better, understanding when to enter the market, when to exit the market, and kind of what's happening throughout that period. Secondly, understanding the market cycles can help us have a longer term view. You know, when you're looking at the charts or looking to enter a position on a day to day or week to week basis, you can really lose context. And third, you can be less emotional if you know what's happening. If the market's going down and it's the, you know, not a surprise and it's maybe an expectation, then um, it's, it, you're not going to put on you know, trades that, that aren't great. And, and finally, it's going to help with better decision making overall if you understand what's happening throughout the market cycle. So why do we go through market cycles? It's really driven by five key points, but there are many others. But these are the five that I'm going to touch on today. Firstly, the macro environment. So things like pandemics, um, uh, pandemics and wars and, and you know, trade agreements between different countries, it really drives um, these market cycles. Secondly, it's market sentiment, how people feel about the market. You know, if people are optimistic about it and think it's going to go up, then that's going to really drive that market or that asset. Thirdly, quite topical, are inflation rates. So inflation rates, um, as we've seen them go up quite a lot recently, and that results in less people maybe investing in um, risk on assets like equities and crypto and maybe focusing more on their mortgage. So that's going to certainly affect markets. Fourth is industry stage. Now some, sta some industries are really mature, have been around for hundreds of years. Others have just started out. Um, so the market cycle is going to act very differently. And finally is regulation. So things like taxes and um, tariffs and stimulus checks is, is going to really push markets in a particular direction. So I don't know, hopefully everyone here has seen this, but this is the Bitcoin chart from 2018. And what we saw was a very steep run up in a short period of time. And then as a result, um, a very quick decline and, and capitulation. And over time, the market leveled out 
Um, but many retail traders, or traders like you and I, um, they, they, didn't, they didn't trade well and lost a lot of money, and it's really hard to navigate these things. And, um, you know, once the market does level out uh, and, and kind of forms an equilibrium, it often goes on to form another market cycle or the base or to, a, to the next market cycle. So I don't know if everyone's seen this or not, but this is the Wall Street cheat sheet. And this is often a reference point to figure out what point in the market we're at. Uh, and it's made up of some really distinct stages. Firstly, the optimism, when people are like, oh, this is going up, I can potentially make money. And many people are buying into the market. And then as the price appreciates, um, people start to FOMO in. They're like, oh, my mate's making money. I'm missing out. I'm just going to buy because everyone else is making money. And at this point in time, the smart investors are looking to exit their positions. And they're selling into the retail market, taking profits. And then as a result, those people that FOMO'd in start second guessing and start making emotional trades and, and exit their position. And this results in a spiraling or a downward momentum and capitulation um, that's often uh, associated with anxiety and fear and doubt and anger. And then what we see is a long-term accumulation phase of the asset class going through you know, a sideways movement where the smart investors are looking to reaccumulate. And uh, you know what I always like to do is pull this out periodically and figure out, you know, have a little bit of a reflection about where we're at in the cycle. Are people optimistic? Are people scared? Are people pissed off? Um, and that's a really good indicator to figure out, hey, how should I be entering a exit in this market at this point in time? And what we've seen in Bitcoin in particular is three distinct market cycles since inception. Uh, and you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's really hard to, to see what's going on. But then when we zoom out, we see, oh yeah, there's certainly a trend here. You know, the trend is up, but it's not as, as aggressive. These cycles aren't as aggressive as they were in their early days. So what are the causes of crypto cycles? Now, the causes of crypto cycles are quite distinct compared to traditional markets, even though they're similar, but Bitcoin has its own qualities. Firstly is the halvening, which is the Bitcoin inflation rate. Now, I'll get into this into a little bit more detail. Um, however, um, that's possibly the most important cause for these crypto market cycles. Secondly, we have innovation cycles. So what we saw in 2017 was companies make, it was possible for them to mint tokens and then raise capital with these. And people refer to it as the ICO boom. And what this did was attract a lot of capital and a lot of talent and a lot of new users to the ecosystem, which spurred that market cycle. And more recently in the uh, previous market cycle, we saw the advent of DeFi, decentralized finance, bringing a lot of capital and talent and, um, and innovation to, to the market, as well as NFTs. So people that may not have been interested in Bitcoin were pulled in from this new technological innovation which spurred or kept the bull cycle going. And then the third element is the adoption rate. So Bitcoin is growing at about 100 to 130% a year in relation to users. And you know the way that we look at this or, or quantify that is the number of Bitcoin addresses that are being used or have been created. And so what this is often compared to is the growth rate of the internet. Now, when you do the maths, um, it looks like that we're about in the 96, 97 mark from a penetration point of view. And, um, and yeah, and you know, that we're really, it's really a race to get to that billion user mark, right? So we're kind of comparing at which, which stage of the market we're at. So yeah, that's, that's really interesting in itself. Now this is a chart that shows the inflation rate of Bitcoin. Now interestingly, very different to the cash rate um, in traditional markets is that the inflation rate is set for the next 100 to 140 years. And this is baked into the Bitcoin code. So it's very predictable. And the way that new Bitcoins come onto the, uh, into circulation is that if you're a crypto miner, you can lend your computing power to the network to validate transactions. And if you do that, you get paid to, to, for lending that computer power. And at the moment, you get paid about 6.25 Bitcoins if, you, if you're able to, to propagate a block. And um, that happens every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes, like a heartbeat, new Bitcoins are created. But 
interestingly, every four years, the block reward or this reward to the miners um, is cut by 50%. And you'll see the yellow line there. Every four years, cutting down um, the, the block reward is reducing. And this is at the same time of the adoption rate increasing by about 100 to 130% a year. So you know, increased demand, less supply, um, creates a price appreciation. So it's um, a little bit more predictable than potentially some other markets. Now, of course, you know, future results may not be based on and, you know, the past, but it's a really strong indicator that many people in the marketplace use and use to position for. And yeah, this is a chart showing the halvenings, those blue lines uh, every four years. Um, the block reward reduces and then eventually spurs um, a, a bull cycle. And you know, yeah, lots of people are, are positioning this and just trade this. And because Bitcoin is so dominant in the crypto market, um, it really uh, it spurs the rest of the market to, to follow in that direction as well. So the next halvening, the next halvening is in March 2024, about 500 days. So this suggests that we're in, you know, a crypto winter or a reaccumulation phase. That, you know, many institutional and retail investors are positioning and, and accumulating through these periods, so that they can take advantage of these like qualities in in the crypto ecosystem. And the big question is, how do we buy the bottom? The bottom buying the bottom is extremely difficult. Uh, your intuition says no. You know, when the market's red, you don't want to buy because you feel like you've already lost money. Um, you know, then you may not have liquidity or cash. For example, other markets might be more interesting, such as property, or you want to invest into tech stocks. And when, when the crypto market's boring or any other market, you know, you may not want to invest at that point in time. And uh, yeah, it's boring. So many people are bored. They, they don't want to get involved. But potentially, that's the best time to participate. And finally, timing is extremely difficult. Even the professionals don't get it right. There's a little story about Michael Saylor, who's the CEO of a big tech company in the US. He's borrowed billions of dollars to buy Bitcoin, and he's underwater. Um, he's lost heaps of money if he sold today, right? So it shows the biggest proponents in the industry, even the best people uh, that know this technology better than anyone, still can't get it right. So we really want to take that decision making out of the whole process, because you know, few, few will be able to execute. Cool. And that's really why we built Bamboo. It's to set and forget, because we don't want to make this decision over and over again. Every week or month when we dollar cost average and accumulate through these periods, we don't want to have to look at the red market. We don't want to have to invest at that point in time. So it's really important to set up your strategy and, and let it slide. Um, it's really important as well not to invest more than you can afford to lose, because this can trigger us to create emotional trades. Uh, if we're putting in too much to the market and the market goes against us, then we want the intuition then is to sell. And as well as that, it's investing at regular intervals is really important. Um, you know, we do this through our superannuation. Every month or every quarter, our employer will contribute and uh, contribute, you know, 10.5% to um, our superannuation. And we're dollar cost averaging into the market, so we get an average price over an extended period of time. So we don't notice those market fluctuations and we don't get emotional about it. It's just a, it just happens in the background. And statistically, you know, that's one of the best strategies to employ for investing. And the way that we do this is through roundups. Every time you buy coffee or some groceries or go to the supermarket, we round up small amounts and dollar cost average into the market so you don't notice it coming out. Now, just overall, I think we've you know, discussed you know, the causes of market cycles, particularly crypto market cycles. Uh, we've discussed you know, potentially ways you can respond to them and strategies to implement um, in order to take advantage of them. So, yeah. I think we've probably got some time for some questions, two or three questions. So is there yeah. anyone in the audience that's got any questions or anything Blake's mentioned there in particular market cycles or any of the slides? Put your hand up and I'll bring the mic over. Got one here. Go for it. Hey, mate. Um, have you got any I can't tips? hear you. Have you got any tips for upcoming ICOs or <laughs> for, for, De for DeFi? Yeah, I don't really dabble in ICOs, to be honest. I don't follow them, but I'm sure there's lots of great people out there um, that you know, have a proven track record that you can follow online. But yeah, always do your own research, and uh, that's probably, probably the best there. way to go. Do your own research. Anything else? 
on market cycles or crypto, bamboo? You had one over there, I'm sure you had one. Um, I know that you keep saying like the halvening is every four years. Yep. Has there, do you ever reckon maybe in the future there could be a one-off where it's not four years um, and it yeah. just throws a spanner in the works? Yeah, so it's baked into the code that after a certain amount of block propagation, every 10 minutes there's a new block created. For Just for an example, after 5,000 blocks, there would be another halvening. So it's never exactly four years. It can be a little bit shorter or a little bit longer, really depending on network activity. Um, but it's set in the code for the next 140 years. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out and if there are any other key elements that um, affect it. But you know, overall, what we're seeing is um, really diminishing returns in the market cycles. Early on, the returns were, were massive. And it's because the market cap of Bitcoin was only about a hundred million dollars, a couple hundred million dollars, but now the, the market cap's in the trillions and it's a lot harder to move the market to go multiples of a hundred as opposed to when it was much smaller. So uh, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely the, the market cycles are changing, um, but they're still um, quite predictable, yeah. One down there. Um, do you think? Um, oh, you can't hear me. I can't hear you. <laughs> do you think um, Bitcoin will um, adopt like proof of stake one day, or they'll just keep to proof of work because yeah. like, proof of stake is way more like energy efficient and stuff? Isn't it? That's a really good question. So the, the way that new Bitcoins come onto the market is miners validating network, uh, validating transactions on the network, and they get rewarded for that. Now there are other consensus mechanisms to be able to you know bring crypto, uh, bring Bitcoins into the market. Um, however, I don't think it's going to be possible to move across to proof of stake just because there's so much vested interest in the current infrastructure. You know, companies have invested billions and tens of billions of dollars setting up the, you know, the, the mining infrastructure. As well as that, there is a strong debate to say that proof of work, which is the consensus mechanism that Bitcoin uses, is the safest. Um, and is the most secure. So I think no one wants to mess with that because it's too valuable now, you know, and it's, it's proven itself to be, you know, and no one's been able to hack Bitcoin. Yeah, so. Good question. Um, what, air, what areas of crypto do you think are most important for the future? Yeah, what areas do I think are most, in future, uh, most important for the future now? There's a lot of innovation happening on platforms like Ethereum which create new sub-industries that previously weren't possible, like decentralized finance, like ICOs, like NFTs. And what we expect is to see many more sub-industries come online over time, uh, you know, whether it's Web3, gaming, but we, the, there's going to be a bunch that we're not even aware of yet. But the technology is going to unlock new industries to spur the technological innovation and more market cycles. And there's, you know, People are betting on more and more things now. There's more venture capital coming into the sector for R&D and to fund projects. And um, some are going to land and some aren't. Some are going to be early um, and you know, look like they have lots of potential. But then you know, they might fall over and it takes another 10 years for, for that you know, particular innovation to get off the ground. So yeah. Any more questions while I'm walking around? Bamboo is only going to stay with Bitcoin. Sorry? Will bamboo expand from Bitcoin and ETH? Oh, that's a really good question. Now, we've tried to stay conservative on bamboo. We only have a Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, gold and silver. And the reason for that is we've seen projects in the top 10 market cap weighted um, of crypto, they've gone under. Like Terra, we saw you know 30 to 50 billion wiped out from one project. And it's like, do we, like, you know, is it up to, like, we don't really want to expose our customers to, to too much risk because we do see, you know, a, a lot of long-term potential in the kind of the blue chips. So what we would like to do, though, is like market-weighted uh, bundles of sub-industries. Um, so, for example, having like a, a bundle of DeFi or a bundle of gaming tokens or a bundle of protocol tokens. So even if one or two does blow up, um, you know, at, at some stage in their life cycle, uh, the others may still do 10, 20, 100x. So we think that's a risk adjusted way of getting exposure to these new and exciting sub-industries without taking on too much risk. So that's something that we're working towards. Um, yeah. Look, I think we're going to leave it there. <coughs> and um, I just want everyone to put their hands together and thank Blake and hopefully you've... Thanks, guys.
Guilty mind. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.